You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Well, I am Daniel Fitzpatrick. I'm here with Timothy Schmalz. We are on the Catholic Bookworm Show, and we're going to be discussing Dante's Divine Comedy in view of the 701st anniversary of Dante's death, which falls today, September 14th, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. Uh, Tim, last year, you at this time were in Florence, um, completing the final sculpture for your uh, Dante project, uh, sculpting one image for for every canto. Um, And we, of course, had the pleasure of uh, collaborating on putting that into book form with a new translation, uh, which was a great delight. But I wonder if you could maybe, to start, just tell us a little bit about that experience of being in Florence for the 700th anniversary of Dante's death, what you did, what some of the most moving sites were, and so on. Anything else that comes to mind? Oh, thank, thank you so much. It was, it was an amazing time, uh, Danielle. It was a very, very uh, spiritually moving moment for me this time last year, uh, finishing the, the final canto of, uh, of the uh, be number 100 of the Divine Comedy. And such a historical place in Florence. Um, I can't believe that a whole year has lapsed since that time. It just went so quickly. But that was uh, um, now when I when I sculpted the Divine Comedy. Um, it was during the time of the pandemic, um, which was I think very appropriate because uh, the idea that Dante wrote the Divine Comedy when he was in exile. I think everyone felt uh, during the past uh, couple years that they were in personal exiles. And um, one of the things that I, uh, uh, after a, a year of after creating the, 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 the pieces, I think about that period of time and I think about the, the optimism that Dante brought me during that time. And I think that it's contagious. I think anyone that, that explores Dante and studies uh, the Divine Comedy will find just a breath of fresh air and a release from this insane world that we're living in right now. And I, it's fascinating because even when you're in hell with Dante, there is that that hope that's there. And I think what, one thing that really touched me working on the project was how refreshing and how unique it was to see the world through Dante's eyes, where there was so much structure and and lines and absolutes, and you think about our culture today, about how there um, it, it's in a state of nihilism to say the least. Um, where you had a, and I, not, it wasn't only Dante; it was the the, the mind of that period of time uh, had certain belief systems that were anchors that through the journey of life uh, would, 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 would hold them and, and give, give them direction. And so, yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience to, to uh, be so immersed in, in, in uh, Dante, the divine comedy. And for me, it was, it was actually um, kind of a, a spiritual exercise. It was a ritual and I think that that's human nature, that you need to have something uh, physical to to grab onto in many respects. And for me, it was the clay and the bronze and, and to actually uh, uh, have these uh, these beautiful, wonderful, poetic ideas that I could I could do something with uh, tangible with 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 my hands. And I, I oftentimes think that that's what a rosary is all about is well why do you need a rosary why, why do you need a physical thing and, and that's that's the human nature we we love tactile things we are physical beings and i think that's also um people reading books that's a physical activity as well they're turning pages people that are writing poetry that pen moves that hand moves the pages move and so it was an amazing experience and uh, and really what it did um from that point onward, as it inspired me to have more courage on other projects and other other mm. blind spots as far as visual art that um, 
that warrant being represented in as many different ways as possible. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I think that's that's one of the things that's most striking about Dante is, as you say, he is so anchored mm-hmm. in this this medieval way of looking at the world, and so he has like, you know, there's so many passages in the poem that are you know more or less lifted from Saint Thomas Aquinas, um, and so he's able to tap into this whole Thomistic way of viewing the universe um and that gives him a space almost in which he can really attend very closely to the things of the world and that's one of the things i find most astonishing is like you'll be going through you know the most miserable parts of the inferno with dante and he brings in these just really lovely uh similes that bring us back to just a very closely observed life in italy like all these great lines about, you know, the the rustic who uh, wanders into town, right, into a big city and looks around in astonishment at, uh, you know, all this great throb of life around him. Um, or the, you know, the the rustic who, who wakes up um, one morning in fall and sees the, the frost on the ground and thinks that snow has fallen and goes back inside in despair. And then as the sun burns off the... Uh, the frost realizes that he still has time to harvest his crops or like even the image of, um, you know, different characters peering at each other through the gloom of the inferno, like, like an old tailor uh, peering at, at the eye of his needle. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can just imagine Dante doing, you know, as he wanders Italy, um, just observing so closely everything that's going on around him, you know, seeing what it is to be a shepherd, um, seeing what it is to, you know, waiting for his clothes to be fitted and watching not just a tailor, but the old tailor um, at his work. Mm-hmm. And that, just, that to me is just so moving in Dante to see the way that even in the midst, because of course he's writing this poem in exile, that this exile, though it brings, there's always a kind of rage with him, um, but that rage is always accompanied by this really great tenderness for uh, for Florence and for the rest of Italy as well. Um, yeah, it's just, it's such a comfort to read him. One, one question I always come back to, and I'd, I'd like your, your, uh, your impression on this. If you, if he wasn't in exile, do you think we would have had the divine comedy? What would, do you think that he still would have created it? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, so, cause he has, I think probably one of the benefits to him of exile is that it, uh, you know, it clears up a lot of his time in some ways for turning to these sorts of pursuits. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, he's, he's, he's no longer participating in civic life in the way that he was, you know, he comes not long before his exile to be one of the most politically advanced members of his family. Um, So he's sort of climbing the political ranks of Florentine life. Um, And so, yeah, the exile, I think, gives him a lot of this free time so that he starts. I think he's he's written the Vita Nuova before his exile. And then the first 10 years of his exile are really productive uh, with getting into into works like uh, De Volgare Eloquencia, right, on the on eloquence in the vernacular, Um, the Convivio, right, this, this banquet. Um, but he leaves both of those works off unfinished, I think probably because he is so preoccupied with the comedy. Um, and yeah, I, I almost wonder if, if he needed the exile in order to have the, I think maybe both the kind of anguish of the heart as well as maybe just the, the free time to, uh, yeah. to make it happen. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think he would have. I, I, I don't think. I think you. Um, and that's, I think, the problem with a lot of people in this this world. We're we're being pulled, and he was, I believe, pulled in so many different directions, and and that, and uh, that silence and that that forced uh, removal from that that those blurry days of life um, actually gave him that that creative space um, to go there, and I think. I oftentimes think that I, one of the most impressive uh, uh, ideas or uh, elements of, of Dante is that he actually thought of doing such a huge project to begin with. 
And I, I'm like, I'm working on some big projects right now. And, um, and I think that there really takes courage to actually think of, of doing big things. But I, I think that, um, for him, that space, he had to fill it up with something and it had to warrant mm -hmm. him losing everything. And so it couldn't be something big, a uh, little. It would have to be something that would match his losing his whole bloody life. And so the only thing he could think of is, well, I'm going to go through heaven, purgatory, and hell. That's right. Okay, that's good. That's good enough. I'll do yeah. that then. So he, so he, he has some sort of peace about his existence. Um, and that was a, a very tall exchange, but I think it worked. And I think that, that us, I think that's what we can also learn from, from Dante is that that what might appear to be a horrible negative thing in your life, you can replace it. But like Dante, mm -hmm. you probably have to replace it with something pretty big. And uh, but um, he had to have the courage to 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 not um, like I can just imagine when that idea came to him, there must have been some negative uh, resistance in his spirit or in his mind about doing such an epic uh, project. Mm -hmm. But but he tenaciously went for it. And, and jumped right in. And so as far as anyone that's creative, whether it be a, a visual artist like myself or a writer, or a philosopher, I think that's, that is wonderful. And something that we all can learn today or, or we need to hear today about look at the big stuff. Don't just focus on the little, the little small things. And it's like humanity right now is being, being spliced into so many different, uh, uh, individual fractions that that I think we lose our wholeness of a human. Whereas if you read the Divine Comedy, it's it all comes back, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's so true. I think about the the courage to undertake a project of that scope. Um, it goes very much in hand, I think, with uh, almost like the works of building the great medieval cathedrals. You know, if I'm you know, if I'm beginning this, I'm not going to see the work reach its conclusion, all right? Um, you know, if I if I'm starting Notre Dame, you know, uh, it will it will not be completed until after my death, which of course Dante just barely completes his poem uh, prior to to death. Uh, but you can imagine, yeah, this this the courage to to undertake something um, with the knowledge that I might not finish it myself. Um, what was the space? What was the space after he completed the last part of uh, the Divine Comedy? What is the space between that and his death? Uh, I don't think it was very far at all because, um, is I want? I mean, I want to say it was it was within months, right? That he because uh, does he is it in March of his la of thirteen twenty one that he completes the Paradiso, and then it's September that he that he dies. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's another really uh, uh, interesting fact about, about uh, uh, that people really need something um, to uh, cling on to for, to give their life meaning. And uh, yes. I've heard of people that when they're done an epic project, they die. <laughs> right. That's right. why yeah. I, I, I'm always trying to have a big project on hand. You know, one in the background yeah. or something like that. But it gives you life. It gives it gives you excitement and it gives you meaning, right? Yeah. And but uh, yeah, we've well, got a that, number of uh, of fairly uh, fairly substantial projects going on right now. And you you told uh, you told me earlier about some of them. But do you want to uh, for the for the viewers and listeners uh, talk a little bit about some of your projects now? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I felt it was an accomplishment to actually uh, uh, sculpt. Uh, 100 cantos of uh, the divine comedy and i think yeah. that's an accomplishment yeah, imagine, great actually, imagine actually uh writing the poetry for the divine comedy <laughs> well, that's really something but that, that gave me a lot of confidence to to work with big subjects and um, mm -hmm. and so right now i'm working on some some huge projects i'm i'm doing for the uh, uh basilica in orlando uh, epic stations of the cross that are 12 feet tall, 11 feet wide, and they're holding all these amazing 
uh, scenes, well, the Stations of the Cross, the, the last day of the life of Christ. And within that, I thought, okay, so I can do the figures in the foreground, but wouldn't it be interesting in the background scenes to have all the parables in the New Testament kind of woven in the landscape, like a sower yeah. in the back and everything like that. And I think with, with artwork, um, when you're doing epic projects like this, they become boring. It's just because you're working nine, 10 hours, 11 hours a day on them. Mm -hmm. So in order to relieve that boredom, you have to make it more interesting. So you have to mm -hmm. put more of yourself into it. But when you put more of yourself into it, it takes more time. So then that becomes yeah. boring. So then you have to actually add more to make it more interesting and to keep your interest. So it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense. But yeah. I'll show you one project I'm working on right now, which is for California. And you can see here. Wonderful. This is the scale of them, right? And uh, this is a Calvary scene. It's going to be 50 feet long. It's a Calvary Amazing. scene. And uh, 50 feet long. It's just crazy, right? And uh, this is how I start yeah. them out. This is Pontius Pilate here. And this is a guard. And so it's huge projects. And actually working on the Divine Comedy and, uh, and actually being so close to uh, another artist, a poet's work that Dante himself really was an absolute inspiration for me. And, um, and so, and I have the benefit that I'm not in exile. And yes. so <laughs> I can go out and travel if I want, but I really can't because uh, right. of my time. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's amazing. I oftentimes think about Dante too. and about. Um, oh, yes. yes. Hello. All right. Yeah. We're joined Had now by uh, Kiki Latimer. <laughs> Well, right, I'm going like to have technical difficulties pretty soon because my phone's down to 17. I didn't realize that. Okay. I've already sucked up a lot of my my juice for my phone. But hey, how are you doing? Hi. Sorry about that. I was waiting for you and you were waiting for me. Oh, <laughs> and, no, uh, not at all. Apparently not in all. limbo. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Hot limbo. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Hopefully Kiki Latimer. Right. Yeah. I was just on the phone with Sebastian trying to figure out what the problem was. Yeah. Well, I'm so pleased to uh, to meet you. I'm pleased Hello. to meet you. So who is Daniel and who is Timothy here? <laughs> so I'm Daniel. Um, yes, I was fortunate enough to work uh, with, with Tim and Sebastian on the Dante Project, uh, putting together the new translation with Tim's uh sculptures of course it looks like it's an amazing project i i'm so sad it's over with but it's actually uh, you'll you'll think i'm crazy danielle but um uh the last canto of the divine com uh, comedy uh has a beautiful representation of mary and i'm actually doing a three-dimensional sculpture in my studio right now of Mary, oh, how wonderful. she's represented in the last canto. And, uh, but that's, that's it for a while with Dante for me because yeah. I got so many other projects, mm -hmm. but one could actually, uh, spend so much time on representing Dante and, and, and because it's, it's, it, he holds so much wealth there, artistic wealth that could be reinterpreted, promoted and suggested more. But um, right. sure. yeah. that to me is one of the I, things that's always most astonishing about him is that when he's dealing with such, at least to the modern mind, such abstract things like heaven, hell and purgatory, uh, you know, what, what could possibly be, be said about those. And yet he brings so much imaginative uh, vision to those, to these realms. Um, and it's, it's almost as if the more spiritual the poem becomes, it also gets that much more physical and that much more sort of muscular as he goes through. It's just really astonishing how he does that. How did you uh, two wind up collaborating on this project in the first place? Yeah, that, um, so I published a novel back in 2000 
I guess that was 2020, early 2020. Um, I had been prior to that uh, for a few years working very slowly on a translation of the comedy. Um, and then I think Tim and I were, we were basically connected through Sebastian and the WCAT network. Um, you know, basically we, we were brought together because Tim had mentioned that he was working on his sculptures and Sebastian knew I was working on the translation. Um, and so we, uh, we had a phone call one day and talked about, you know, maybe trying to put together a new, a new illustrated translation in honor of the 700th anniversary of the publication of the Paradiso and then the 700th anniversary of Dante's death last year. Yeah, it was, it was really a, a fun project because here we were coming close to this, uh, historic anniversary. And we kind of had, uh, uh, we did the, we developed a, a friendship during this time. And of course it was the time of during the pandemic. And, um, so it was, it was great to, uh, to be fed some translations, some new translations um, that were inspirational for me in my interpretations. And so it was, it was a great, it was like we we're on a ladder here coming to this great uh, anniversary uh, together, both um, using our, our creativity and our skills to, uh, to present uh, the 700th anniversary of the divine comedy in a, in a, a, a very interesting, unique way. So, yeah, so it was great. And can't believe it's been a whole year since then. Unbelievable. Uh, Very hard to believe. How did your views um, change, evolve during the project as the sculptures were being made, the illustrations were coming about? Um, how did that affect how you saw what you had written or translated? Mm. Definitely... So you, there are so many, there's so many images of Dante out there. But one of the things that was very striking about Tim's images, one is that, you know, they were progressing evenly through the poem, um, which most, like, if you look at, was it Doré? I think he has like, um, I don't know, like almost a hundred images, maybe more just from the Inferno. And then, far fewer for the Purgatorio and then even fewer for the Paradiso. Um, so Tim had this very, you know, just like even like balanced look um, carrying us all the way through the comedy. Um, but then also the method that Tim was using um, really reflects some of the visual art that Dante gives us, um, especially in the Purgatorio um, where, where he gives us these, these really, amazing sculptural images on like the basically the floor and the walls of the mountain of purgatory that are helping to form the soul uh for this ascent um and so I, to me the fact that that tim's method was in a way embodying kind of like the sculptural style that dante himself employs in the poem was just really uh sort of magical just for sort of uh bringing to life helping to put me into the life of the poem itself in a different way that, that other visual representations hadn't really done before. Yeah. I believe that, um, that reading only the inferno is um, like reading only the old Testament and forgetting mm -hmm. about the new Testament, which so many people do with Dante. And so, mm -hmm. so the idea of, of visually making it equal, and that's, you know, it's, it's, what is it, 31, 30, 30. Um, no, it's, well, well how many yeah, 30, 34, 33, 33. Yeah, 34, 33, 33. And, um, and so they are equal, I think, for a reason. Um, and that has to be, I think, ha has to be represented in the artwork. Like you, Danielle, mm -hmm. if you're going to do a translation of Dante, you, you would go straight to hell or you'd remain in hell <laughs> if you did. 50 <laughs> right right so right, yeah. that's what that's that's i think what what the artists and our culture really does is they put an emphasis on the inferno and and then they they distort what uh uh what what dante's real intention was there right and so yeah so that's 
that's I think, and and with with having the sculptures um, equal, they take up equal amount of space. And like I, I said when I, st- I first started it, I heard that, and I think you told me that, Daniel, that most people like there's a statistic out there that ninety percent of the people that read the Divine Comedy stop at the Infernal. Yeah, oh, that's so sad. And <laughs> but they can't when they look at it. They're not going to close the the sculpture book, or they're not going to actually uh, turn around from the sculpture garden and go back after they're done in Inferno, right? right. Um, but I, I think also that I think one of the great things about your translation is um, it breaks the uh, it kind of breaks the 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 fear that a lot of people have about about reading Dante. And I remember when you first uh, mentioned your approach no footnotes no footnotes and you're going to make it that it's porous that people are not intimidated by it and i think that's the same with with spirit of of my artwork is that um i wanted to uh select a scene from that canto that would intrigue someone presuming that they never read dante before this is my one shot at it so to speak right Mm -hmm. so i better make it exciting for them and um, but I also have things that if you're very familiar with Dante, you'll pick up on it m- more subtle sure. things, right? But um, yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah. So walking through the sculptures, what do you hope people will see? Dante. <laughs> I hope they get uh, like at first. I thought this is a great supplement for for the Divine Comedy, and uh, it's just like I think Dante or the Divine Comedy is is an invitation to spirituality, to Catholic spirituality. My sculptures are an invitation to the Divine Comedy. So it's an invitation to an invitation, I think. And, um, and if, it, if it works that way, great. Um, if, it makes, if it makes people a little bit less, less scared of, of jumping into the Divine Comedy, jumping into Dante, then the sculpture... It's truly a functional sculpture project, and it's done its job, which I think it it will. So I'm curious, how did it change you? You've worked on these for, what, two years now or a year? Well, it was a solid year, Um, Mm -hmm. and uh, I'm still working on it. The first uh, Dante Park, the complete Dante Park, is being installed at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, right in the center of Toronto. Wow. And that's that's happening in November. It, the, their Dante Park will be finished, um, but it it basically it was like I think what Dante does is it reaches out this spiritual hand as a guide, and it brings you over. and And so when you, I think with my artwork, I felt more connected to um, humanity from centuries, from seven hundred. You, you know, I I felt this this that these 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 people from 700 years ago especially dante are very relevant to to our lives today and they have something to say and and we have wisdom that that we can um we can benefit there is that that closeness through centuries that comes comes upon uh jumping into dante and like uh, we mentioned before the idea of of how fresh and how how wonderful it is um, to have structure and to have um, a belief system like Dante about how the world is organized. And, uh, and that, that kind of goes against the, our, <laughs> obviously goes against our mainstream culture, which basically is, is very chaotic. And um, how peaceful it is to, to have uh, the ideas of uh, absolute, whether it even be the different departments in hell, it still brings one peace, I think, because at least it's some sort of structure, right? <laughs> Which I think our culture really needs right now. And so it's a breath of fresh air, fresh new air coming in from uh, uh, a poem that's 700 years old, which is fascinating. And um, and also, I'm, I'm at awe after, after interpreting, visually interpreting um, the Divine Comedy. I'm amazed at the courage of Dante. Um, to take on the big things. And if I could give one big criticism after reading and studying sculpting the Divine Comedy after 700 years is we become smaller people. We become looking at little things and forgiving and 
and we have to we have to look up at the sky and not always be focused on the compartments of little things and i think i think that that he kind of anyone that jumps into divine comedy will have courage to to look at the bigger picture and i think the more we look at the bigger picture uh the more human we will be and in a sense we lose our humanity when we get so so focused on one little detail and i think that's our modern day or our contemporary society pushes you into that and um uh, and i think it strips one of humanity when when one does that so those are some of the insights also just the courage to to if dante had the courage to 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 write the divine comedy at least i can have the courage to uh sculpt what he wrote and um but that just in a sense opened up my my mind to be less fearful of of different different things to sculpt and um i think that that's one of the ingredients of being an artist is is not to be afraid and it might not come across face to face as a fear but really i think that's what it is a lot of people are afraid to 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 do artwork of big epic important things and um uh, and that i think that's one of the problems with art today is it, art for art's sake is turning its back on the the real function of artwork and that's where you you get into the idea that artwork is just um all about style it's all about making you see things a little bit different those are optical illusions that's not the the purpose of artwork the purpose of artwork is is connected directly to spirituality and um and just like the divine comedy he wouldn't have have had the 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 stamina to have done such an epic beautiful poem on any other subject matter i don't think and um and so it's it's it confirms a belief i have that in order to do an epic piece of artwork whether it's a poem or a painting you have to have an epic subject matter and isn't it is it not kind of uh uh obvious to most people that the divine comedy is the greatest poem ever and uh it's because of the subject and so that just his artwork confirmed that unfortunately i have to go because my phone is going to die in 5 minutes <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice talking um it's it's great after uh the year after the 700th anniversary to to once again think about dante yes. well i certainly believe people are drawn by beauty and your sculptures are beautiful um so you know beauty is always the first avenue by which most people enter the spiritual life so i i i i wish it much success it's beautiful um i'm excited so this is a permanent exhibit in toronto yeah there this is the first i'm planning on making several different dante parks around the world hopefully okay. and so the, this is the first full set um um but actually i have to leave right now because you're turning really blurry <laughs> <laughs> and i'm going to lose you soon so okay. thank you so much and uh thank you. let's keep on thanks, promoting Dave. Dante any way we can thank you sounds thank great you. thanks bye bye daniel bye so how was the experience for you of doing this translation sounds amazing it was, yeah it it was wonderful yeah and it was um it was really a delight just to spend so much time with the text um to get to to get to really know Dante on that level um and to just over i mean the bulk of the work was done within about a year um but i had started the process several years prior to that um so just to over a long period of time spend uh a lot of time just thinking with with Dante um yeah it was a really transformative experience for me certainly So you speak you speak and read Italian which so, is your first uh, language. Yeah, uh, I mean English is my first language. Um okay. Italian I used to speak it much better than I do now. Um it was yeah I so I learned Italian when I was studying at the University of Dallas which is where I first encountered Dante. Um and but of course that was several years ago. My engagement with the poem as a translator really began at the prompting of an essay from the poet Ezra Pound who mentions that if you want to be a good poet 
one of the most important things to do is to translate a great poet um, from his language into your own. Um, sort of in the way, it's kind of the closest thing that a poet can get to copying the works of the masters in the way that a painter might do. Um, mm -hmm. Because of course, there's a, there's a certain benefit to, you know, just copying out Shakespeare's sonnets um, or something like that as a poet. Um, but to really get the kind of intimacy with the technique um, that a painter might get from copying, you know, um, a Rembrandt or a Monet, um, it, it, it's really much easier to do that by translating um, than by just copying. Um, and so that was how I started it. Um, and of course, there are so many, um, there's so many aids to the would-be translator available, just since it's not, uh, it's not by any means a, a text that has, has lain untranslated. Um, right. And that's one of the things that's so fascinating about the comedy is that it seems like, uh, like every year there's a, there's a new, a new translation of it. Um, someone is just drawn back to uh, engagement with the text in that way. Um, and so that's one thing that's cool too, is there are so many great poets over the centuries um, who have crafted their own translations. And so it's, it's really amazing just to look at that kind of, that kind of conversation that's going on um, just because translation is always an act on some level uh, of interpretation. So it's really interesting to see the ways that different poets have approached Dante in uh, rendering him into their own, into their own languages. Why do you think people, I mean, I think Timothy is correct when he says most people only, you know, get through the inferno. Um, they don't mm -hmm. continue on with the next two. Why do you think that is? Yeah. So I think there are a number of reasons. One is that my assumption is that for many people, their acquaintance with Dante is limited to uh, the classroom. And of course, unfortunately, many times when Dante is assigned in the classroom, it's only the inferno that is uh, required. Um, so I'd imagine that that has a lot to do with it. I do think some readers who get through the inferno just feel so exhausted by, by that point that they're uh, ready to move on to other things. Um, I think also there's a, there's a kind of fascination with hell um, that draws some people to read the Inferno without perhaps uh, going to the others. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the main thing is probably just that sense of being intimidated by, you know, if, if someone gets through the Inferno, then that's probably enough for them. Um, because it is, of course, a very, a very, very intimidating poem in the way that, um, you know, the Homeric epics um, are not, um, you know, Homer, of course, is not so, so wrapped up in local politics uh, and all the other sorts of things that, um, you know, Dante is engaged with. Um, and there's so much less of a tradition for someone like Homer to be engaged with than Dante, who is, you know, of course, not only dealing at least indirectly with Homer, but also, of course, with Virgil and Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas and, uh, just about every, just about everything that could have been known by someone of his time and place that he's uh, grappling with in this poem, um, and yet I think for all that, it's still very possible just to read the story, as it were, um, and to journey with Dante um, from this this point of departure of simply being lost in a very human way. And that to me is one of the things that, that remains most, uh, most relevant about Dante is that for all of his learning, for all of his references, for all of his politics, and all these things that can seem very peripheral um, and can kind of bog us down, the poem begins with someone being lost, um, which is an experience that, uh, that everyone has. Um, you know, whether it is, uh, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a student who, um, you know, realizes he's failing a class right before the end of the year, um, whether it's something more serious, like, you know, a, uh, you know, like a parent who wakes up one day and realizes like, you know, I have, uh, I have, I have an alcohol problem. Um, I have an anger problem. Um, there's this whole gamut of experience that I think is gathered up 
in that very beginning of the poem, right? In the midst of the journey of my life, right? I returned to myself through a shadowy wood for the right way was lost, right? And that, that sense of the right way being lost, we all know that in some way. We've all been there on some level. So I think that is why the poem continues to, to really call people across the centuries. So if you were doing a commercial as our guide into the, the second two books, what would you say to someone who's made it through the inferno mm -hmm. to continue on? What's the draw for the next two books? The first thing I would say is that one of the wonderful things about getting out, getting beyond inferno is that we get into much more fresh and clear and open air. Um, and there's a kind of expansiveness about, there's this expansiveness about the, uh, about the latter two um, canticles. Um, that's just so, I don't know, it just feels so free after the, the tighter and tighter enclosure of the inferno. Um, along with that, there's an ongoing imaginative expansiveness. Um, so Dante, of course, I mean, the, the whole poem is a marvel of, of imagination in some way, some way or another. Um, but once we get to Purgatorio, we start to, I think, really bring together all the strands of what, go, what goes into restoring man, not only to his original glory that's intended for him um, in Eden, which, of course, we, we end up in the Garden of Eden at the top of the mountain of Purgatory. Um, but then in bringing him beyond that into the mystery of the incarnation um, and in Christ's passion, death and resurrection. And so I think, um, especially for someone who is interested in uh, Catholic spirit spirituality um, and in, I guess, kind of a, a mystical approach to life, right, in, in the sense that life on earth can become just a very smooth segue into eternal life uh, the rest of the comedy especially purgatorio and paradiso um, give us this kind of this kind of map of what does that mystical ascent look like um, and you can really you can see a lot of um, a lot of sort of synergy i guess between what dante is doing and then what um, some of the later carmelite mystics are going to be looking at um in terms of like the you know the, the the purgation of the senses and the spirit um on this ascent to union with god um and it's just really it's just the the poetry just gets so so lovely um especially as we get as we get to meet more and more of the saints in paradiso and then finally um tim was mentioning the the really beautiful description of mary um in the last canto is just really, really wonderful. So unlike other Catholic bookworm interviews that I've done, I, I make a point of reading at least most of the book. <laughs> um, I have not read your translation. Um, I've read Dante's Inferno many years ago, like you said, probably in college and bits and pieces mm -hmm. of Purgatorio and Paradiso. Um, so, and I know, and I know, for instance, that Peter Kraft did a translation a few, uh, maybe 10 years back, and it's sort of been on the list mm -hmm. to read that translation. Tell me why I should read your translation. Yeah, so, and I mean, of course, there, there are so many good ones. Um, the things that I aimed for were, were kind of three. Um, so first... My aim was to present the sound of the Italian as much as possible in English. Right now, of course, there's a there are many many limitations to that. Um, but my goal basically was to give because because poetry exists in the sound primarily, um, and that's the reason, of course, why translation is so difficult, especially when it comes to poetry. Um, so I wanted to preserve the sound of the original as much as possible. Um, beyond that, um, one thing that I've found in reading a lot of translations is that a lot of times translators, perhaps because they are not themselves Catholic, um, or 
um, have just sort of a, a shadowy theology in some way, um, miss a lot of what Dante is doing in the poem. And their translation often kind of reflects that. Um, so that there's, there's a lot of very potent theological meaning that is in a lot of, even down to the level of a lot of Dante's word choices, that I think gets missed in a lot of translations. So I tried to uh, preserve the sound and then secondly, preserve uh, Dante's Catholicism as much as possible. And then the third thing that I really aimed for was to preserve Dante's poetic technique by preserving the force of his metaphors as much as possible. Um, because I think that's another um, another area where certain trends fall flat. Um, I find that um, some people tend to almost translate out a lot of the metaphors, uh, which is interesting because metaphor metaphor is basically in some ways the Greek equivalent of translation. Um, they both mean bearing a cross. Um, and so just to give an example, there's a point in the Inferno when Virgil tells Dante to look across the swampy area. Um, but instead of saying, look over there, what he says literally is flick the whip of sight. Now, a lot of people just translate that as look over there because they're basically taking it, uh, you know, uh, making it, you know, more idiomatic for us. But when you do that, you lose so much of the, the tension of the language um, where Dante has loaded the language with this, this extra meaning that's certainly not carried across by just saying, look over there. Um, <laughs> of course, when you say flick the whip of sight, like you're even saying something about the way that you conceive of vision working, right? Not of just like passively receiving images, um, but that my act of looking is something that is, is actually an act that I'm casting my attention over there and bringing back the reality of that thing in some way to myself. Um, and so those are the, the three main things that I tried to be attentive to. Um, you know, and of course it's, uh, you know, there's so many, as I said, there's so many good translations available. Um, so, and I would, uh, not really try to, uh, contend with many of the, the heavyweights out there, but, yeah. um, it was certainly a delight for me to do it. And I hope, I hope at least the, the poem can, for some people be, be somewhat more accessible to the translation. Um, one, so I'm just, just curious, to, how did you translate that line, flick the whip of sight? Because that's quite a line. Yeah, I just uh, I just translated it just like that. Um, that's got a lot of tension in that line. I've never it heard does. that. It does, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, unfortunately, the room I'm in uh, is needed. Um, so we may, have to, uh, we may have to conclude here. Um, well, but it was such a delight to speak with you. Thank you. I will try to get my hands on a copy and perhaps we'll have a subsequent interview. Yeah, that sounds line. great. I would love that. Sounds good. Thank, right, well, you thank you so you much. So much. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.